Well, thank you. It's my great pleasure to be presenting on the behalf of the American Society of Echocardiography, these new guidelines for fetal echocardiography. My name is Anita Moongrady. I am a professor of clinical pediatrics at the University of California, San Francisco. I'm also the current president of the Fetal Heart Society and a fellow of the American Society of Echocardiography. I have no financial disclosures, but some of the writing group members uh, who all contributed quite a bit to this presentation uh, do have the disclosures listed on this slide. So why do we need a new fetal echo guideline? Well, it's been almost two decades since the American Society of Echocardiography released its last guidelines on fetal echocardiography in 2004. And since then, advances in the field um, have really taken off. Um, imaging improvements, knowledge advances, multi-center collaboration and clinical trials in the fetal therapy and fetal echo world have all taken place. So the time has really come for pediatric cardiologists who focus on fetal imaging to provide an updated statement on current best practices on fetal cardiac imaging and fetal care to complement recent guidelines that have been published by the American Heart Association, the American Association of Ultrasound and Medicine, and the International Society of Ultrasound and Obstetrics and Gynecology. So in the next 20 to 30 minutes, I will be mostly talking about what's new since the guideline is so comprehensive, we can't possibly cover it in that short amount of time. So one of the biggest questions that's debated in the literature and was debated by our writing group is who actually needs a fetal echocardiogram? If fetal echocardiography was not a limited and somewhat costly endeavor, we would easily say fetal echocardiograms all around. But instead, pregnancies that are at low risk for fetal cardiac disease are screened during an obstetric anatomy scan. Now that is universal. But there's increasing debate about where to draw the line of who would warrant a referral for a fetal echocardiogram after they've had uh, usually normal anatomy scan, an obstetric anatomy scan, and specifically those who may have a condition that increases the baseline risk of fetal cardiac disease. Now, there's been a lot of literature published in this area since the last guidelines, and this literature debates uh, center around the need for additional testing when the anatomy scan is normal. But the problem is there's a huge variability in how well the screening performs in different settings, and this affects the post-test probability when the pre-test probability is already known. And this may be at least in part why prenatal detection of cardiac disease still remains lower than uh, we would desire. So in a, essence, the guidelines still continue to recommend that certain fetal and maternal conditions that convey an estimated risk of over three to 5% um, based on available evidence, those still are gonna warrant fetal echocardiogram even in the setting of a normal screen. Um, but knowing the sensitivity and specificity of your local area and the cost benefit balance that's desired by your resources and environment may change where you set the exact threshold. There's definitely no debate that if the screen is abnormal, then those patients should have a fetal cardiac uh, evaluation. The guidelines though now differ from prior guidelines in that based on more recent evidence, second degree relatives with congenital heart disease other than those of Mendelian inheritance and uh, pregnancies with a single umbilical artery, maternal obesity, or uh, some of the listed teratogen exposures probably don't warrant a fetal echocardiogram unless the ultrasound second trimester anatomy scan is abnormal. So again, I only have a limited amount of time to talk about these guidelines. There are many more 
uh, and nuanced uh, concepts within the uh, indications. And so there are now tables that compare the new recommendations from the ASE with the newest uh, AIUM and AHA guidelines if uh, you are interested. When? 18 to 22 weeks, that has not changed. The best window for transabdominal fetal echo is 18 to 22 weeks gestation, which is similar in timing to that ultrasound obstetric anatomy scan. And while we're increasingly pushing the envelope of how early we can image the heart, uh, especially when there's concern or higher risk for congenital heart disease, first, first trimester exams are going to have a lower sensitivity and should always be repeated in the second trimester. But we are now uh, including them in our recommendations for a fetal echocardiogram that this could be considered. And there are detailed uh, recommendations for the, both the performance and indications of the first trimester fetal uh, cardiac evaluation. Serial fetal echocardiograms are something a lot of us have, have been doing for years, are necessary for abnormalities of the heart up to 34 to 36 weeks gestation as some uh, lesions can change with time. How many and how often depends on the condition and the discretion of the, uh, of the care team. But we did for the first time in this guideline list some uh, sort of loose recommendations, uh, none of them evidence-based, all consensus-based, but uh, nevertheless, some recommendations for when uh, to, to, uh, to schedule follow-up examinations. The new thing that I am uh, most proud of, I think, is this new approach to standard imaging planes. So shown here is the line diagram that was included in the 2004 ASE guidelines, which basically recommended trying to replicate the transthoracic uh, views. What we have done is attempted to harmonize at least that initial look at the heart across all fetal cardiac guidelines, obstetric guidelines, radiology guidelines. And I think that uh, this is, again, something I'm particularly proud of is that we're now recommending that instead one start with five or six axial screening planes that start with abdominal situs and go to four chamber view, three vessel view, three vessel trachea view um, using sweeps and cine images. Um, we then go on to elaborate on sagittal and parasagittal imaging that really makes this a complete cardiac evaluation, especially when the patient's uh, not normal. And we include in all of these recommendations, links to videos in the guideline, uh, which are free and uh, available online or to download. So we've done things like recommend not only that the ductal and aortic arches be imaged in both axial and sagittal planes, but also shown some tips and tricks uh, as far as how to obtain these views. For instance, by a simple 90 degree turn of the transducer once the appropriate axial plane has been obtained. There's also a huge emphasis on the screening views done by obstetrics, MFM, radiology in terms of speaking the same language. And so we start with chambers and visualization of moderator band and tricuspid mitral offset, but also add that in cardiology, it's extremely important to image these structures from two orthogonal planes. Outflow tracts are also uh, strongly recommended now by most of the uh, non-pediatric cardiology guidelines. And in fact, since 2013 have been required in obstetric screening. So we demonstrate how one might image the outflow tracts in two separate views. 
uh, but also strongly recommend three vessel view screening either in axial planes or uh, sorry, still frames or video and acknowledge that there was some difference of opinion among our writing group as to what exactly a three vessel view uh, was and um, came to the conclusion that we should probably allow for several different versions of a three vessel view, all of which show the aorta and superior vena cava in the upper mediastinum and some of which include the pulmonary artery bifurcation, some of which are just a millimeter or two cranial to that and can include the ductus arteriosus. So there's no real wrong way to display a three vessel view. Although I would say still frames only like I'm showing on this slide, it's probably not ideal in a, a cine capture is probably better. Three vessel trachea view, something that uh, our writing group felt very strongly that people in the cardiology world needed to become very facile with. This is a great way to diagnose vascular rings and other um, abnormalities of the great vessels. And so it's, this is now demonstrated and quite prominent in the guidelines. And then there are some of the parasagittal or um, valve directed imaging that will look familiar to cardiologists who do pediatric transthoracic imaging, things like the base of the heart, uh, papillary muscles, and uh, mitral valve apparatus, for instance. As I said, there are accompanying videos for most of these recommended planes. So uh, we have redone some of the artwork and paid close attention to still frames uh, being married to the appropriate cine loops. Color Doppler, of course, I'm not gonna spend too much time on uh, pediatric cardiology considers this part of, uh, of, of the exam. And uh, there was not a lot of debate about this. Some tips and tricks on how to use the color, for instance, how to evaluate the foramen flap and the fetus from the sagittal view are uh, diagrammed in the guideline. We also, of course, include Doppler and Doppler and more Doppler. Um, ductus venosus, inferior vena cava, hepatic veins, so representing the systemic veins and the uh, fetal placental circulation, as well as inflows, outflows, branch pulmonary arteries and pulmonary veins, highly recommended pulmonary veins, uh, Doppler required, as well as uh, arches, both ductal and aortic, and then the umbilical vessels. So what about this is new? Um, the pulse Doppler components that are required are now also going to include umbilical vein, pulmonary veins, ductus arteriosus, and umbilical artery. And we just note that uh, the starred uh, Dopplers are consensus-driven change from prior documents, and uh, and uh, we, the writing group felt very strongly about those. Now, there are others that have been and remain required, such as the ductus venosus and, uh, and inflow and outflow Dopplers, and then some that are recommended but not necessary for every normal patient. So to summarize, UA, UV, ductus venosus, pulmonary veins, one from each side, all of the valves and the arterial duct uh, should have a pulse wave Doppler or spectral Doppler included in the exam in addition to the color Doppler. We've expanded our discussion of cardiac rhythm, both how to assess the rhythm and how to assess when it's not normal. So the method that you choose is sort of not dictated by the guideline, but we do have examples of uh, several different methods for assessing not only the fetal heart rate, but the rhythm, whether it be sinus or whether there be some premature atrial contractions, which is shown uh, in the guideline in a lot of detail how to assess those from the different, using different modalities or different locations. And also arrhythmias such as atrial flutter, uh, 
and supraventricular tachycardia. So this guideline contains not only uh, normal examples, but also examples of abnormal. There's also an expanded section on function. In general, the assessment of function should include 2D imaging of systolic and diastolic function, Doppler and color Doppler of the AV valves, umbilical vessels and ductus venosus, and uh, quantification of the cardiac size, the cardiothoracic ratio. So those would be for all patients. Further quantitative assessments of functions such as uh, myocardial performance index and cardiac outputs are going to be warranted when there's concern for potential uh, pre-existing cardiac compromise. And so how to do these things if you need them are uh, detailed in the guideline. And the cardiovascular profile score can also be used in uh, these cases. Tissue Doppler and strain are mentioned as being sort of on the horizon uh, for potential use as well, but we're felt by the writing group to still be in the, the research realm. And so uh, we're not included. There are new sections on cardiac biometrics and measurements. And uh, I would say that the cardiothoracic ratio as diagrammed uh, here is now required. Dimension of the AV valves from inner edge to inner edge also required. This is in early, di uh, early diastole. And aortic valve annulus size, in systole, early systole, and pulmonary in early systole. These standards were chosen by the writing group because of the availability of Z-scores um, at this particular point in the cardiac cycle, realizing that there are uh, at least one uh, set of Z-scores that uh, was made with the aortic and pulmonary valves in the closed position. Uh, but because of of uh, many years of experience um, with using early systole for this measurement, we chose to go with, uh, with that. Um, aortic arch and how and where to measure is necessary for patients with suspected aortic arch abnormalities, but these and pulmonary artery measurements are considered to be at the discretion of the examiner or at the discretion of your lab protocol as well as uh, where to measure the arch from sagittal or from uh, axial scanning. We also have chamber dimensions, lots and lots of examples of how one might do these measurements uh, if one were so inclined. And hopefully this will standardize uh, these measurements for uh, research use uh, in case we choose to uh, add these to a guideline in the future. But for right now, uh, just the cardiothoracic ratio and the valves are required. Some people really like checklists, and so I present this uh, to you. There are several types of checklists in this guideline. The first one shown here from table seven takes a segmental analysis approach to a checklist. So. Uh, it goes over fetal position, situs, systemic veins, pulmonary veins, um, AV connections, VA connections, arches, and branch pulmonary arteries. So you pretty much your standard uh, segmental analysis and which recommended views you might use. There's also a more detailed checklist of specifics uh, if that's the way your uh, brain works. So these are, are meant to be sort of interchangeable types of, of checklists uh, for more for learners, uh, but also for quality assurance. I did mention, and I'll mention again briefly, that fetal echocardiography in early pregnancy is discussed in this document as something that may be considered for certain indications. This is a patient with normal anatomy and uh, the Doppler patterns are a little bit different, but the anatomy from about 12 weeks on is going to be visible through transabdominal scanning and um, the use of color may help uh, as well. So if the risk is high, 
and your uh, lab is trained and has a protocol for this, we now have this as part of the recommendations in the new guideline. Keep in mind though that um, the heart is still very small. I have shown here a one centimeter marker on the left-hand side. So high frequency scanning uh, for short periods of time, and you really need to be close enough to the fetus for your high frequency transducer to have adequate penetration. So um, appropriate equipment, scanning at an appropriate gestation can get you this uh, information, but it does take a little bit of uh, additional effort. Um, we do a lot of these at UCSF, so can be quite daunting. Here's an example of twins. Uh, but with uh, the right settings and, like I said, some perseverance, it is possible to clearly make an anatomic diagnosis in this uh, one of twins who has hypoplastic left heart syndrome, complete with a small left ventricle and on the right retrograde flow in the transverse aorta and even left to right flow at the atrial septum. And here's another example just to drive the whole point home that the pictures are the same. They're just a little more challenging to obtain and they're a little smaller, but this patient uh, with tetralogy of Fallot and pulmonary atresia uh, diagnosis also made as early as uh, 14 weeks and zero days. All right, so now you're gonna ask me, well, what's really new? Since all of this really just looks like a fancier and more detailed echocardiogram, well, this part of the guidelines was um, uh, sort of near and dear to my heart because we do so much, uh, so many abnormal exams in our lab, and because we teach both sonographers and uh, and fellows. And so, what we propose to the ASE is that we actually include not how to do a normal fetal echo in this guideline, but how to really dive deep into an abnormal fetal echo. So this updated guideline expands significantly on key considerations and additional imaging to guide management and counseling for structural abnormalities. We've divided it into major sections for single ventricle heart disease, complex AV connections, lookalike outflow track abnormalities, progressive lesions, and isolated arch abnormalities. And then the common themes across uh, approaching each one of these types of, uh, of abnormalities or lesions is detailed and comprehensive and serial assessment of the fetal heart is detailed um, as is uh, necessary for appropriate counseling, prognostication, delivery planning, and intervention planning. So just as an example, I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but say you have a four chamber that's obviously showing a single ventricle. The guidelines now go through, well, what are, what are you thinking? AV canal, tricuspid atresia, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, double in the left ventricle. Let's say, all right, we've sort of narrowed that down. We have an abnormal four chamber. We think it's probably hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Now what's really necessary for the rest of that fetal echo? What other lesions are we gonna look for? What uh, would be considered um, missing if we didn't do it, such as looking for atrial septal restriction, measuring the diameter of the ascending aorta. So the ascending aorta di diameter was uh, shown in a diagram of how one might do that measurement. But now we're saying, okay, for this lesion, now you have to do it. Now it's required. So, uh, so detailed there. Uh, and then we have examples and pictures of how to do all of these things, how to assess left to right flow at the atrial septum, how to assess the pulmonary veins, how to look at forward to reverse Doppler ratios. So a lot of, uh, of people who have been doing this for a long time are not gonna need this amount of detail in a guideline. Uh, this was more geared towards the, the advanced learner and again, towards uh, labs that want to be able to use these guidelines for their quality assurance programs. 
Another example, say you have an LVOT abnormality. So these are the lesions that have an apparently normal four chamber, but the outflow tracts are abnormal. What should I be thinking? And how, uh, how do I approach tetralogy of Fallot versus uh, double outlet right ventricle? or transposition of the great arteries and what additional measurements and imaging do I have to do in order to make that echo complete now that I know that the patient is abnormal. More tips and tricks in the abnormal section with lots of videos looking on FOSS at the mitral valve, for instance, in this example of a double outlet right ventricle with a straddling mitral valve that might affect how the counseling is done and to manage patient expectations. Uh, we have similar examples for atrioventricular septal defect and how one might make specific measurements of the tricuspid uh, and mitral valves or the uh, AV valve angle as shown in the upper left, or on FOSS measurements of the uh, valve orifice and trying to uh, extrapolate uh, indices that are known to be predictive of single ventricle versus two ventricle outcome postnatally. Uh, this is uh, shown here that we can do this in the fetus. And then finally, in this abnormal section, uh, just a smattering of arch abnormalities that one might see in isolated uh, three vessel, three vessel trachea view abnormalities, uh, such as uh, in the movie, a double aortic arch which I like to say all double aortic arches have three arches. Uh, so it's a bit of a misnomer in the fetus. Uh, there's additional information in this guideline that I would encourage you to read on safety, image optimization, documentation of the exam and, uh, and image storage recommendations, adjunct ad or advanced imaging such as MRI and rhythm analysis, uh, such as fetal magnetocardiography, delivery planning, there's a section, and uh, image-based risk assessment for both delivery planning and surgical planning. So to summarize, what's new? Well, we have fewer indications and the emphasis is on performance and screening at the level of the detailed obstetric exam and uh, knowing what your own regional uh, uh, obstetric uh, availability is, as well as the risk and uh, cost of, uh, of whatever uh, policy you have. We're moving away from replicating transthoracic views and harmonizing the language across all people who evaluate the fetal heart, whether they be pediatric cardiology trained or obstetric trained or radiology trained. We have recommendations for early fetal echocardiography and expanded sections on assessment of rhythm and cardiac function in normal and abnormal patients, as well as this expansive um, information on a lesion-specific basis of approaching the fetal echo in the abnormal patient. I wouldn't uh, be able to finish without thanking all of the many uh, real luminaries, experts in the field who I had the privilege of working with in developing this guideline. First and foremost, Mary D'Onofrio, my co-chair. I want to specifically call out Nalangi Pinto, who uh, has written a uh, editorial of sorts outlining some of the things that I discussed in this talk. But really, everyone uh, worked so hard to develop this guideline. It took probably two years to come to fruition. And that entire time, uh, Lise Blandino from uh, the American Society of Echocardiography was our absolute, uh, absolute rock. We could not have done it without her. And so with that, I will leave you. The QR code shown on the screen is a QR code directly to the guideline. There's also a CME module. So if you read the guideline and are in the Learning Hub at ASE, you can obtain CME credits for, uh, for just reading this, uh, this document. Thank you very much. And thank you also to the Fetal Heart Society who also endorsed this document and this, uh, and this lecture.
And of course, a big thank you to Fujifilm for their support of this recording.